Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Good to see our farmers here this morning. Imagine if all you planted in all of your fields were strawberry plants. By the way, brother, I've never seen a strawberry bush, much less a strawberry tree. <laughs> uh, my uh, daughter, bless her heart, she planted some strawberry bushes for me uh, while I was away this summer. And uh, my grandsons have been feasting on them ever since. I've had a few. And uh, they're, they're much, much sweeter than the ones you buy in the grocery store. So that's been very nice to have. It's got to make sure it's me. So I have to hold it up so it can see me. All right, well, I, I want to ask some questions about the two passages that uh, Brother Logan read for us in the scripture reading. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. That means they don't look like wolves. On the outside, they, well, they look like very long-snouted sheep, I guess. Uh, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. That's the, that's the phrase that's mentioned here twice in verse 16 and in verse 20. And then he asks two rhetorical questions. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? And the expected answer is no, they aren't. Or are figs gathered from thistles? And the answer is no. So every healthy tree bears uh, good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, why would Jesus mention a tree being torn down or thrown down and put into the fire? What is he trying to illustrate? By the way, just so that you kids know, we're not talking about people who have apples or oranges growing off of them. These are people who don't have the right kind of living for them. And you can even tell a child who is born again because there's a pattern of life obeying his or her parents. There's a pattern of life by them uh, wanting to tell the truth and not lie. There's a, a pattern of life that they're not mean to each other. They try and be nice as Brother Logan said, or Pastor Logan said, uh, they try and love other people. But he's talking about false prophets, and what he means by those trees being thrown into the fire is false prophets go to hell. They are not saved people. They do not go to heaven. It's not just that they talk about some different things about the Bible False prophets are lost and condemned for all eternity unless they change. A prophet is somebody who claims to speak for God. But not everyone who claims to speak for God is someone who really truly does speak for God. And that's the lesson of this part of the Sermon on the Mount. And sad but true, many of the Jews' religious leaders were false prophets. They were false teachers. They did not tell the truth to people. And that's why when Jesus looked on the multitudes, they were as sheep without a what? Because these Jewish religious leaders were not shepherding the Jewish people the way they should have been. And so he continues this same theme in verses 21 through 23. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So, so here's, the, here's the same theme. Someone who claims to be something that he or she is not. And in our passage, someone who claims to be a Christian, but let me put it this way, stands in great danger of never having been saved and will experience what is read here in verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the ones who enter the kingdom of heaven are those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Again, it's what he does. It's what he produces. It's the kind of behavior they have. And let me just start at the beginning. Save people go to church. Why? Because they love Christian fellowship. Unsaved people don't go to church necessarily. Sometimes unsaved people do because they were raised that way, like I was raised that way. You're going to go because your parents say you must. But saved people want to give. Their father in heaven gave to them, and they want to give. They, they are careful about making sure whether you call it a tithe or whether you call it an offering, you want to be generous in your giving. Saved people want to tell others that they are saved. And I don't mean that you're telling other people that the other people are saved, but I'm born again. And, and therefore, I make certain choices in life that demonstrate that I'm born again. Maybe from the time I was a child, those, those uh, habits of life are not the same. Uh, my parents don't still live. I have no parents to obey. But I, I do obey the authorities that God has placed over me, or I try to. And uh, so he's talking about the product of life. But he says... Verse 22, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and by repeating the name, they're showing special devotion to him. Lord, uh, Lord, uh, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do many mighty works? And these are miraculous things. You say, well, a person who's going to do that has to be saved. Well, obviously not. Either your thinking is mistaking or Jesus is wrong here because he says these are the very people he's going to tell, I never knew you. And it reminds us that it's not always those religious things we do. It's the way we live when nobody's watching. It's the way we act when nobody's there to try and be persuaded that we really are a religious person. In the first paragraph, false prophets claim to be true prophets. They're not. In the second paragraph, some people claim to be following Christ and therefore going to heaven, but they are not. How do we recognize that they're not really Christ followers? And obviously you can't tell if they don't ever do religious stuff because these guys are prophesying and casting out demons and performing other miracles. But you know what the Lord calls them when he said, I never knew you? You who work lawlessness. There it is. Yeah. It's not personality that shows someone is saved. It is whether or not I am conscious of seeking to follow the word of God in my daily manner of life. That's what it is. 
And we have a story this morning that begins in Acts chapter 8. We're going to read, well, eventually the whole first 25 verses, but we'll begin with the first eight verses. These verses describe the effect of Stephen's martyrdom. We talked about that last week. Stephen was martyred. He was put to death. What was his crime? He followed Jesus Christ. If that were against the law in Canada to be an open follower of Jesus Christ, if that were a law, is there enough evidence to convict you of that crime? Are you so dedicated to Christ that in your daily behavior, anybody watching you would say, I think that person's a Christian? Well, uh, this is what the effects of Stephen's public witness and his uh, death after that. They accused Stephen in Acts chapter 6, verse 8 through the end of the chapter. They heard Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verses 2 through 53. And then they murdered Stephen, Acts chapter 7, verses 54 And then we begin with our first verse, that Saul, that is Saul of Tarsus, the man who became the Apostle Paul, approved of Stephen's execution. When Paul was explaining to Jesus in Acts chapter 22 why he should stay in Jerusalem, Jesus said, now I want you to leave Jerusalem, but Lord, and and he's giving these reasons why he should stay. They knew my manner of life before, and they're going to see that there's been this Christian transformation in me. And the Lord tells him, no, but this is how he defended himself, Peter, or or rather uh, Paul or Saul of Tarsus. When the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. So here was Saul. He approved of Stephen's execution or his martyrdom. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered, that is the Christians in Jerusalem were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Basically, that's all the land uh, west of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. They just left Jerusalem. And think of this, how many believers were there? They were talking Probably tens of thousands, I mean at least ten to 15,000, and many, if not most of them, just fled the city. They got out. So a persecution arose. They scattered abroad, except for the apostles. They did not leave, and... Devout men, verse 2, buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. That in and of itself would have been a dangerous thing to do under times of persecution. But Saul was ravaging the church, spoiling, ruining, destroying the church, entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. In chapter 9, when we get there, uh, the next time we come to the book of Acts, we're in the last half of the chapter, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. Um, But when we start chapter 9, Luke begins with a description of Saul. Uh, But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He was a madman. He hated the name of Jesus. He despised the gospel message. He had devoted his life to destroying Christianity. There are still people in the world who are doing that. And they would love nothing more than to put you on film while they cut your head off and show the world what they are willing to do to people 
who serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I mean, this sounds terrible, but notice what it says. Those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And I think in this you have an explanation for why the Lord allowed it. Everywhere they went, they preached the gospel. And now, here's an example of that preaching. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. That's about 60 kilometers north of Jerusalem. And he proclaimed to them the Christ. Uh, and what was their response? Verse 6, the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. As he preached, they all, all were just riveted in their attention to him. Wanted to hear what he said. Wanted to understand his explanations with one accord. When they heard him and when they saw the signs, the miracles that he did, um, unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So as a result, there was much joy in that city. Of Samaria, And here I want to help you just to keep something in the back of your mind as we go through this passage. Jesus was here several years ago in Samaria talking to the Samaritan woman. Not only was this woman saved, but many people from the village of Sychar which was a Samaritan village just outside of the main city of Samaria, many of those people were saved, and Jesus remained there for some days, discipling them. And so the church is not beginning from scratch in Acts chapter 8. It's continuing to build on the ministry that was there. And over against this amazing advance of the gospel, in spite of rising persecution, is the story of Simon. And it's often entitled Simon the Magician or Simon Magus, the uh, Latin term for magician. Simon is introduced to the reader in verses 9, 10, and 11. He believes Philip's preaching in verses 12 and 13. He offers the apostle Peter and John money if they would give him, that is give to Simon, authority over the Holy Spirit. He doesn't just want the Spirit and the Spirit's power. He wants the authority to completely manipulate who the Spirit of God goes to and fills. And then in verses 20 through 24, his faith is exposed. And finally, in verse 25, there is a conclusion. So, having taken up the first half hour with just introduction, now we're going to begin the message in verse 9. Uh, we meet a man named Simon. His name tells us that he's either a Jew or a Samaritan. After all, this does take place in the city of Samaria, so we wouldn't be surprised if he was a Samaritan. You know, I thought about this. We, we name our children all kinds of things that really don't have much to do, oftentimes anyway. Uh, and I think it's generally more true now than it was when I was quite young and we were naming our children, um, there, there isn't a sense of family connection except by the last name. Well, we know that he was a Jew or a Samaritan, uh, and he resides in a place called Samaria, but Samaria is a lot like saying New York, New York. What is New York? Is it a state or a city? And the answer is... Yes, it is. It is both. Samaria is both. It's both the main city in the region of Samaria. So think of Samaria, Samaria. That's what it would be where all of this took place. Now, verses 9, 10, and 11 really focus on the one thing about Simon that 
certainly was most important to him in his past life and most important for Luke's explanation for who this guy is. What is the one thing about him that verses 9, 10, and 11 emphasize? He is what? Yeah, he is a magic guy. Now, we think of magic, David Copperfield, If you don't know that he was a magician, then just forget my illustration. It's sleight of hand. It is is, uh, tricks used to make people think one thing, but then a different thing completely happens. And that's not what this is at all. That is not what this is at all. When we say that Simon previously, or when our... ESV Bibles say Simon previously practiced magic, that may give you the impression that he'd stopped, but that's not the case. The idea here is, and I'm quoting for a, from a, uh, a man who was an expert in the original language, he was continually practicing magic and striking amazement into the Samaritan nation with his claim to be someone great. So he's not just in Samaria, he's in Samaria. He's in the whole region, and he has this reputation. And (laughs) notice his humility here, you know. He's announcing that someone great is coming to town. Someone great is going to be here to dazzle you. Uh, So Simon demonstrated a long-term commitment to Magic. In the ancient world, magic was generally of two different kinds. When you think of the magi, that's where they get their name from, the term translated magic or magicians. The magi in Matthew chapter 2 were an early kind of science discerner um, called a respectable science of discernment. These magi were that. They were, they were um, astronomers. They understood what was happening generally in the sky. And people that had this kind of extraordinary knowledge, scientific knowledge, were considered magicians because most people had no idea what was going on up in the sky. They didn't know the difference between a star and a planet that shines brightly in the evening sky sometimes. And so they were regarded as magi. That's one kind of of, uh, magic in the ancient world. It was more science than magic. It would be like taking some potassium and throwing it in water and saying, if this foams up... You are to pay me millions of dollars. Poof, boom, it foams up. There's millions of dollars. But he's just applying scientific knowledge to that. There's a second kind. The same fellow says, this is an adulterated species full of quacks, charms, and incantations. Okay, that was Simon. Okay, full of quacks, charms, and incantations which may have been attended by demonic power, which amazed people if it was. This is likely the kind of magic that Simon practiced. And if we had to go back through these verses and choose a word that describes how people responded to him, he comes, he begins his uh, magic that he's performing, and how does that affect the people He uses the word, it amazed them. Wow, this is remarkable. It amazed the people of Samaria, verse 9, verse 11. They paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. And Simon was not humble, as we already saw. Verse 9 states that he said that he himself was somebody great. It was, by the way, nobody can say that and be humble except God uh, because he really is great. So uh, just hard to imagine somebody billing himself this way. 
Um, he was not humble about his gift. It was Simon himself who claimed to be someone great. He freely accepted the accolades of his Samaritan audience. Verse 10, they all paid attention to him. Notice the words now. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. So if we're watching a program telling the Bible story about Simon, we might begin by following Philip and his preaching of the gospel about Jesus Christ and observing some of his miraculous works. Wouldn't it be great to be able to watch the story of the Bible when it's accurate to the Bible? That would be a remarkable thing. And uh, so here he is, you're showing Philip and he's preaching, you're showing the faces of the people as they're following him. Remember what it says in verses 6 and 7, the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip and uh, they heard him and then you, you, you see some of the miracles he performs and uh, the realism with which they were performed. Unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who, heard, who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. But then the camera zooms in on one person, one man, very well-dressed, looking both concerned and himself amazed, because verses 12 through 13 explain how and why the amazer himself became the one who was amazed. Same word. The one to whom everybody paid attention is now paying attention to somebody else. So we move on to the second, Simon believes in verses 12 through 13. Two things happen to the Samaritan people as they listen to Philip preaching. If you read verse 12, what are the two verbs? What are the two things that take place? Well, the first one is that they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And the second thing that happened to them, they were baptized both men and women. Philip preached the word in verse 4. He preached the Christ in verse 5. He preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ in verse 12. And so Philip is explaining and illustrating and quoting and arguing and applying, and the people become now the objects of the Spirit of God who is working in them this sense of repentance, who is working in them this clear belief in what Peter is or, or in what Philip is saying. Uh, they knew the gospel message because they heard him talking about it, they affirmed that the gospel message that he was preaching was, in fact, the truth. He was giving evidence that it was the truth from what he was preaching from. But the real key to saving faith is the third part of it. They committed themselves for the forgiveness of sins to that message. They made up their mind. Nothing they had in their life that was sinful was worth hanging on to if it meant they were going to lose their eternal soul. And so many of them believe. Many of them want to talk to Philip. Many of them, perhaps there were other believers who were led to the Lord by the Lord himself from several years back. Maybe this Samaritan woman was attending but some of these people may have been helped by older believers in the group. Think of this response to the gospel. Then the Samaritan believers gave public testimony to their faith in Jesus Christ by being immersed in water, following their Lord in believers' baptism. 
Verse 12 describes the Samaritans as a group, but verse 13 again zooms in on this one man, Simon. Now we watch him as he sees the signs and the great miracles performed. Simon was amazed. And because of this response, uh, now he was amazed instead of being the amazer. So, so Simon himself uh, believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. If we ask about the three things that he did, if we ask about those three verbs that describe what he did, in response to Philip's message, he believed just as they did. He was baptized just as they were. And I want you to think about this for a minute. Do you think Philip would have baptized him if he was convinced he wasn't really saved? No. No, he wouldn't have. But Philip baptizes him. And then it says he continued with Philip, this is not a normal expression for someone who follows the Lord, someone who is following Philip for discipleship. What it means was he watched him carefully. He attended to what Philip was saying and doing very carefully. All right, so he got saved. He saw these miracles that were performed. He's amazed, but now something changes. You see, into Samaria walk two apostles. Philip's not an apostle. He's not even serving as a deacon in this circumstance. Peter and John come to town, and now all of a sudden you hear nothing about Philip for the rest of this passage. No, no, no. Simon says, Philip is not the one I'm interested in. Now I'm interested in the apostles. So, verses 14 through 19 takes us to our third point. And I've just called the point, Phil, or, or Simon offers the apostles money. <clears throat> but really most of it, 14, 15, 16, and 17... It's just talking about Peter and John. There's a lot of introductory material here. <clears throat> Verse 14, now when the apostles at Jerusalem, so we go back to Jerusalem, the apostles are there. Someone comes running in and saying, uh, hundreds, hundreds are being saved in Samaria by the preaching of Philip. They heard that Samaria had received the word of God, and maybe they remember their time with Jesus several years back when they went through Samaria with Jesus. Uh, so the apostles send Peter and John, who came down and prayed for the Samaritan converts that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus. So Peter and John laid their hands on the believers, whether they did it one by one for quite a length of time or whether they just sort of laid their hands on a couple of them or we don't really know how they did it. They laid their hands on them and as a result they received the Spirit. We need to remember that when Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman in John 4, she's the one who said the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And she was telling the truth. Why are you talking to me if you are a Jew and, and you're not supposed to be having dealings with us? Why are you talking to me of all the Samaritans? And so we immediately remember why <clears throat> they may have on this occasion sent apostles to go to Samaria <clears throat> and to help in the work. I mean, at this point, it's only Philip. There may be older believers there. Maybe Philip has some people with him. We don't know. But 
As far as we know, it's only Philip. And so these two go down there. I don't think they're there to kind of spy out, are these people really genuine or anything like that? In fact, one fellow says, Peter and John's laying on of their hands is best seen as a gesture of the apostolic solidarity and fellowship with the Samaritans. This is a big change. Because the Samaritans were people that grew out of the rehabilitation of the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. They were carried off into captivity. And the way the Assyrians uh, dealt with defeated enemies is they re-inhabited the place that they carried off all the original citizens from with people from all over the Assyrian Empire. So they weren't even Jews, at least not pure blood Jews. And so that's why there was no dealings for some 700 years between the Jews and the Samaritans. So this is a big change. There was no set pattern or order to this in Acts. In other words, people made a profession Then they were baptized. By the way, those two things were one right after the other, all the way through the book of uh, Acts. But then somebody came and laid hands on them. No, that only happened one other time. People got saved. They were baptized. Then generally, they were just discipled in a broad variety of ways. But because this was the Samaritans, They wanted to give some evidence that the apostles affirmed this. So that's the introduction. This is what Peter and John are doing. Verse 18, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered the apostles money, saying, give me this power. Only the word is not dunamis for power. He's asking for authority, exousia. He's asking for the authority. For what? So that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's not asking for the Spirit to choose through him. He's asking for him to tell the Holy Spirit, to make the Holy Spirit go to certain individuals. He's the one who wants the authority, not God. So, first of all, what did Simon see? He saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands. Well, we don't really know what he saw. We don't know what the manifestation was, but we know that there was some manifestation that was visible and he could see. Yes. I mean, my guess is right here and now, if everybody in this room was suddenly filled with the Spirit of God, there would be some kind of manifestation of that if there were something to see. But Simon saw A question that's raised at this point is, did the Holy Spirit fall on Simon? No, we don't know. I mean, we know he had his eyes open and he's looking around and he sees this. But did it fall on him? One of the things about this portion of Acts chapter 8 that is difficult to come to firm conclusions about are the things, it's not just one, it's many of them, the things that the the chapter does not say. And it does not say that he too was the object of the Spirit coming upon him. And at this point, Frankly, Simon does something very surprising to the reader who has accepted at face value that Simon has believed, that Simon has been baptized, and that he continued with Philip for some good reason. 
And what he does that's so surprising is he offers Peter and John money in exchange for that authority. These guys have it. They, uh, they obviously controls who the spirit goes into, which he was wrong in that supposition. Nobody controls who the spirit goes into except for the spirit, except for God himself. So Simon's request misunderstands Peter and John's relationship to God completely. They can't communicate the Spirit in any way unless it is the Spirit's desire. And this is why the apostle prays. This is what he says up above. They prayed that the Spirit of God would come upon these believers. Lord, if it be your will, make this happen. The apostles prayed for this because they do not, they cannot manipulate God. And yet I've no doubt myself among them is somebody in this assembly who spent a fair bit of my young Christian life thinking I could. All I've got to do is fast and pray, and he'll do whatever I ask. All I have to do is obey him with as much perfection as I can muster, and he will do what I'm asking him to do. Now, I'm not asking him for a bad thing. Simon was asking him for a very bad thing. I was asking him that certain family members would get saved if I would do that. But in my mind, in my thinking, I thought I could twist God's arm into doing what I wanted because the thing I wanted was a good thing. And after all, if God didn't want these good things, I had to do something to make him want these good things. More importantly, three questions. Number one. Why does Simon want this authority? What's his motive? What does he want it for? Number two, why does he offer them money for it? Obviously, they came into town. They put up billboards, Peter and John. You give us $1,000, we'll give you the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what they did. They didn't charge money for it. Why would he do that? Where would he get that idea from? And then finally, what does Simon intend to do with this authority? What does he intend to do with it? Now, these are just questions until we get to verse 20. As if our questions about Simon uh, were not enough, Luke adds the words of Peter's response and his rebuke of Simon is in four parts. But Peter said to him, verse 20, May your silver perish with you. Let me put that in different words. The word perish means to go to hell. May your silver go to perdition along with you. That's what Peter is saying. It is Peter's most severe warning here Peter speaks of Simon's feared destination as eternal damnation. He's not saying that he will definitely go to hell. He's saying you are in danger of going to hell. You're still alive, so you're not there yet. Number two, verse 21, you have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Simon has no part or portion. He's not a part of this matter. What's the matter referring to? Well, the word is logos. The word translated matter is logos. Now, logos is a very broad term. We usually think of it as what English word? Word or message. And it may be that he's saying you have no part or lot in this message, but he's saying to him, 
I mean, if it's in its broadest possible context, you have no part or portion in the giving of the Holy Spirit. But whichever that is really doesn't matter. Why? Because uh, Simon's heart is not right in God's eyes in either case. So he says in the third place, verse 22, Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. In spite of Simon's eternal spiritual danger, Peter says, there is some hope. If you repent and seek the face of God himself to forgive what you just asked for. Pardon me. So, if he were to repent, it might sound something like this. Oh God, the intent of my heart was to have control over you rather than you having control over me. If I am yet a lost man, have mercy upon me for Jesus' sake. I want to know you in truth, and so I turn away from my former life altogether. All my vain pride, all my love of money, all my uh, mistaken greatness, I turn my back on. Please forgive me and make me your child completely. And what does Simon say in verse 24? Well, he says, oh, let me finish the last one. Um, Peter says in verse 23, I see that you are in, he, he tells him to repent and seek God because I see that you are in the gall of bitterness. This is an interesting expression. Simon has been made bitter by his envy of Peter and John and probably his envy of Philip. Philip performs miracles that are so much greater than the greatest thing Simon has ever done. He begins to have bitterness, and the word can also be translated envy. But like I said, when Peter and John come to town, he sets Philip aside altogether. Because Peter and John don't just do the miracles they control, he thinks, the one who is responsible for all those miracles. So Simon's response to Peter is weak at best. Simon answered, pray for me. You pray for me that nothing of what you have said come, may come upon me. If Peter is a man of such divine power, it's better for Peter to pray for him than for Simon to pray for him. You ever thought that way? I want you to pray for me. But relationship with God is personal. And, and God has not a care in the world for whether you use fancy words when you pray. And some people say, oh, I can't pray in public. Why? Well, I don't really know how. I always say, just pray the way people in the Bible prayed. And sometimes they're embarrassed because they think they can't say words the way some other person can. And this is dominating the way Simon himself thinks on this occasion. And then it's over. No more. Simon Magus is gone. Now he fills the pages of tradition. My, my, he has long, long history talked about him 
based on these few <laughs> words. That's the problem with tradition. When you read about tradition that's not specifically biblical tradition, put a whole pound of salt in there with that little tiny bit of tradition and believe it at arm's length. It might be true. There might be some reality to it. But we don't live by tradition. We live by Bible truth. The reality is this. The terms of Simon's conversion in 12 and 13 are plain enough, but nothing Simon says or does (coughs) after Peter and John arrive, nothing he says or does indicates any change of heart or thinking about his former life. Once Peter and John get there, he acts just like a pagan. There's nothing he does to indicate he is a saved man. Now this incident in Samaria doesn't really deter Peter and John because on their way back to Jerusalem, now fortified by the work they're convinced God's done in Samaria, Uh, Verse 25, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to many of the villages of the Samaritans. And now what the woman said to the Lord Jesus in John 4 is no longer true because now the Jews have a lot to do with the Samaritans and the Samaritans have a lot to do with the Jews. Now, I just want to apply this in two ways. Number one, sin can be very difficult to leave behind and walk away from, especially when we're older, because sin grows deep, deep roots. And sometimes people will come to the Lord. And they want to be saved because they want their marriage fixed. Or they want to be saved because they want to stop drinking. Or they want to be saved because they want to stop being addicted to drugs. Or they don't really want God. They just want change in their life. But they are not willing to repent all the way to the bottom of that tap root of sin. They just, you know, let's clip off the top of it. I've changed some of my habits. So now you save me, okay? And because of this, some come to God for a negotiation. But the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, that's what Titus 3, 5 says salvation is. The washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit is not the result of our negotiation with God. No human being negotiates with God. God determines what is done. And you can say, I don't understand. I really prayed. That's not the point. Did you repent? You say, well, I believe. I have I have knowledge of the gospel, and I believe. Did you commit your entire life for the forgiveness of your sins when you heard that gospel message? No, salvation is not the result of a negotiation with God. It is the result of a an unconditional surrender of everything in me to him. Everything is on the altar for him. Nothing is left out. It is not most of what I need to change. I want to change. But boy, there are some things that nothing will make me change. And sad, that's true. You will go to hell, never having changed, and neither will you in eternity. No, 
Salvation is not a negotiation with God. It is unconditional surrender. And unconditional means un-what? There are no conditions for that relationship. I come with nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Have we done that? Now, that's if Simon was lost. There are some people who believe that he was genuinely saved and he was, he was just still attached to all that magic thinking and uh, the money that goes along with it. Uh, there are over 120 televangelists in North America who make more than $10 million a year off of fake religion. Ten million, 120 of them. What kind of people watch them? What kind of people send them money? People who are trying to negotiate. Let's, let's try and reach an agreement here, God. And there is no sin from which God does not make a way of escape. And I know the grief of heart by, by personal experience of thinking that there must not be a way of escape from this. I mean, this thing has just gripped my life and it won't let me go. Well, is there anything that makes you stop being tempted? Well, yeah. Like what? Well, if I pray. It stops. <laughs> if I read the word of God, it stops. If I listen to, to Christian music, it stops. Uh, in other words, yes, this is the way of escape. I'm showing you the way right now. Are you doing this? Well, it's a strong, strong temptation. And sometimes we think that God is just has abandoned us. But no, his word is still true. Woe be to the Christian who makes a treaty with some personal sin or sins. I make no treaty with them. Do not want them. And over and over again, I've asked the Lord to take my life, just like some of the old prophets in the Old Testament. I don't want to live anymore if I have to live this way. So are you willing? I mean, make sure your insurance is paid up. Because then, you know, maybe God's going to take you at your word and say, okay, you'll die tonight. And then you won't sin anymore. Well, God has made us and saved us lock, stock, and barrel for himself. He didn't put us here to be our own people. He put us here to be his. He has made us for himself. And we will never, ever, ever be happy people until we are happy in him. We find our joy in him. And I don't know, my own personal conviction is that Simon was not saved when it says he believed. Now we know that that occurs elsewhere. In John chapter 8, the people, many people said they believed in him and Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, then you really are my followers. I know you said you were, but that really doesn't mean anything. Obedience is the test of reality. So have we done that? Have we said, God, nothing is enough. Uh, nothing is negotiable. All my sin, I need to give up. All of it, every bit of it. I mean, I've told you before, sad but true. I drove like the worst pagan sinner there ever was up until about 10 or 15 years ago. And I thought, what gives me the right to drive in, in disregard for the authority that God specifically tells me to yield to? So have we done this? Have we put our lives on the line for God? Nothing 
Nothing is beyond him taking away from me. I want it taken away. I would rather have him than anything else in life. Anything else in life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth. And we pray that you'd help us, Lord, to be out and out for you. Pray, Lord, that you'd bless our church. That you'd give us souls to be saved and saints to be strengthened and preaching servants to be sent out, ministering the word of God. Lord, that you'd bless us as individuals. We want to be yours and yours 100%. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.